The following program is intended for mature adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. You have been warned. And welcome back to Flavored Enemy Behind the Screens. Uh, today I have with me Cisco from Roleplaying Degenerates. Um, Cisco, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm Cisco with uh, Roleplaying Degenerates. Um, I guess uh, how you guys or anybody knows me in the social world is that uh, um, we are degenerates in the uh, role-playing industry, uh, mostly D&D. We do dabble. We have been dabbling in Pathfinder and other things, but... Uh, uh, but we mostly do the Discord thing. We really enjoy our Discord, having people come in there, talk, play games, one-shots, and all that stuff. Uh, that's our main thing. Uh, but we do enjoy making content and meeting new people, especially all the other content creators out there and collabing with everybody and creating a wonderful community. The other thing uh, I'd like to say is that... Um, uh, what was it? Is that... Um, dang it. You know what? Uh, scratch it. If I think about it, I'll come back to it. Uh, but, no worries. Uh, oh, no, I, know, I remember. Uh, I was going to say that we do have a stream group, and we are working on producing a stream group with a uh, high-quality stream group, but it's going to take time and personnel, and we don't have those. Uh, we don't have personnel. We do have times and when we would like to do it, but we are working on the the group, you know, that, that crit roll group or that yeah. Dimension 20 group uh, where everybody just feeds off each other very well. Yeah. So, so we're yeah. still working on that. I get that. I get that. I mean, all, all the kind of those kind of passion projects take a lot of time, energy, and resources, and it's a hard thing to build up. Yeah, and resources are hard to come by, especially yep. when you're a full-time job. I got three kids, and mm -hmm. that's... It's busy life. Yep. Um, so I'm I'm the DM over at Flavored Enemy. Uh, so we run uh, all kinds of uh, all kinds of campaigns across the TTRPG uh, game systems. So we have uh, in our D and D five E settings, we have uh, what's currently wrapped are the King's Call. It's our first season, and Tales of Vittori is our most current season, as well as we're concurrently running Flavored Enemy Legacies, which is a collection of one shots that take place around the um, party and during different times within the Torre, uh, all done by different DMs and including different players and such. And then we also have upcoming our Scourge of Stars campaign, which is a Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars system, which is set in a alternate timeline uh, within the Star Wars universe. Uh, and that's coming out on July 13th. Um, and we run our live streams here on Discord, and then we post all the reps, all the stuff up on uh, wherever, wherever you can watch your podcast, so Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the whole thing. Um, so I've been DMing for about nine years now. I've been playing for about eleven. Uh, just watch. How long have you been? How long have you been going with it? I'm actually still fairly new compared to you. Uh, let's see. I've been out of the military for uh, been my full first year, I guess. Yeah. I'll be able. So two years, about three years. I would say about three years playing and okay. kind of just took off with it and really loved it. And I'm basically trying to make it my full-time job eventually. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so to kind of get us started, um, so we're going to be talking about encouraging role play. Now, this talks about, like, um, encouraging role play within your players, encouraging cross role play between your players, and encouraging that kind of, like, delving into the character you know stepping away from the things like you know my character does this or um sir flame does this referring to yourself as in the third person um and you know really assuming that role really becoming that character how do you get them into that mindset and you know how do you how do you pull someone from the side of you know where board games where it's all dice rolls and and no no communication how do you bring someone over to the role play side of tabletop role-playing games um so it kind of kicks off and kind of gives a good starting point how important would you say is role play to your games um i think role play is a very important key factor in dungeons and dragons because i mean yes you can just go in there have fun and just kill the you know kill everybody or 
you know, fight all the time, but okay. I feel like you don't get the full flavor of D and D if you don't role play with it. And yeah. there is so uh sorry, my kid's weak. Uh no worries. So there's I feel like you're missing I feel like you're not completing the puzzle if you don't role play. Like when you're fighting, would you just kill a guy and just move on? Like don't you wanna be like how you kill a guy like some epic battle that you'll never get to do in real life you know these are things anything you want to be you can be and then some that you would never think of and why wouldn't you take full opportunity of that and enter that character and enjoy every bit of it and yeah, no. that, yeah and that's where i think it really it's really important to role play in D. &D. yeah there's going to be characters that are good at really good at and there's gonna be characters that are really bad at it Mm -hmm. But there is, everybody can be at least above uh, uh, average. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the more you practice, the more you get better at it. And, and there's going to be those players that really love fighting. And you know what? Good for them. And that's, that's, that's your thing. That's your niche. But you'll also be, you'll also be surrounded by people that enjoy that too. Mm -hmm. And if that's the type of game that your team wants to run, that's the type of people that you're, it's all, I mean, that's all that's all good for you and i totally encourage that if that's what you enjoy but i feel like you're gonna be missing you know that that extra you're not gonna complete the puzzle if you don't get a you know at least describe combat to a little role play behind it you know have some yeah, fun yeah i agree it. yeah I, I agree i mean like you you have to find that that entry point and like you said describing combat that's one of the one of the ways that i find that people who are more into the the combat stuff at the beginning how to get them into the role play itself is just getting them to describe their movements, their motions, their combat, uh, because we're, they're already into it because of the dice rolls and the determining numbers and calculating uh, pluses to hit. And if you're playing second edition, that mysterious thing called Faco. Um, and all this stuff and combining it with the description, the descriptions, the, the, the the narrative that you can use with actually describing how the combat and stuff occurs um and that's just i think a big part of it and a big part of a big a big way to actually embrace that kind of role play is start with something small like that um now like yeah there's always going to be characters who are more geared <laughs> towards the, the the dice rolling and the number crunching and stuff like that and and going that way um but eventually they'll get, they'll come around to it, and, and that's kind of what we're analyzing here is is how to kind of encourage that that growth into the role play. Um, so I found that one of the one of the bigger things um, that that I can do to actually encourage that growth into role play is to place them in a situation that they're not going to be able to uh, roll their way out of. Um, uh, so some people, some people will, some, some people will be like, this, this kind of DMing is a little bit railroady. But this is, this is meant in that building moment. This is not something you do the whole time. Like you're um, really pushing your players here. That's yeah. It's kind of like that. It's, it's. I wouldn't say it. It's kind of like comparative to that BBEG fight where it's like. Should we run or should we stay? Like you don't know how hurt that guy is. You don't know how you guys are just hurt, and you think you you know you've given your all. Is it is it one punch away or is it ten punches away? And everybody's gonna be TPK. It's like it's that moment. It's like your character. You gotta push your characters to like make decisions and all that stuff. It's really you know yeah. those things are important in D and D, and it really grows characters. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Um, and then like when when it comes to when it comes down to when it comes down to it, you know you just gotta have to. Take it, take that situation, and you got to make it a narrative push. The only way that you're getting past this is with narrative choices, narrative decision making and stuff. Um, and that's how you're able to get to a comfortable place within the story and also encouraging that role play. Um, so, I'm bringing over to the next spot. When it comes to actually like bringing the, uh, the, the, the narrative to the players, how do you go about presenting a role play situation to your players in a way that they then role play back? Like, how, how do you present that information? Um, so the way you can kind of present it is like, uh, it's like really 
if you can if you can do statements and like do things where you're like where you finish the sentence in that player's name so you're specifically like it sounds terrible but you're calling them out to respond and really make them think on how to respond and this will get the characters used to responding and yeah. if you do that with each individual character eventually whenever you're talking they'll just start asking questions in the middle of speech or anything like that and you're like okay this is what i'm looking for yeah there's there's people right here and they actually enjoy what we're doing now and talking and you know everything's going smooth finally and that takes that takes probably at least 10 sessions with new very new players but yeah once you break that threshold though it's it's not you know it's beautiful mm -hmm. yeah i agree and like one of the uh one of the one of the key things to do there is that when especially with players that you that you're friends with before D, &D like players that for, for those of you who are not in like the the D, &D podcast or like that that kind of scene um the players that are your friends the ones that you know and socialize with on a normal schedule those names nicknames and things that you refer to them as outside of D, &D drop the minute you hit that table because the minute that you hit that table, you're not those people anymore. You're the characters within the game. And as such, once you start referring to them there in that manner, it's going to encourage them to respond as the character instead of as a player controlling a character. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. Um, so, kind of bring it back a little bit. Um... Let's say let's let's say you you're, you're hit with a situation, right? You got you got like let's say three new players at at your table, and you're you're DMing, and you got three three players. And, uh, when you're DMing that, and you're kind of getting them to open up, uh, are there any kind of particular situation, scenario, adventure, plot hook, or something like that that you'd like to use, or a kind of like system that you like to use to kind of like get them used to the concept of role playing? Um. See, I haven't DM'd too much, but the concept, like, to just really get them role-playing is, like, is to find common grounds behind, between the, you know, you know, the characters, and then bring that upon everybody, and, and hopefully that it just collides really well, and it just starts a conversation between the group, and to get them really talking with each other, and, um, really getting a character, and... And even if you show, like, hints of, like, early backstory intertwine, you're like, everybody's like, oh, shit, you know that guy, too? And I was like, yeah, I know that guy. Well, was, okay, what's going on here? It could be completely different. It could just be a guy that knows everybody, but it could, uh, <laughs> but it's a really good way to bring everybody together, and you can really get people to, uh, to really talk about things and be really worried about something when it could be nothing. But... Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Um, and then, like, when it comes time to that, that kind of situation, presenting the information, I think, is that, that, that big key when it comes time to, like, actually encouraging the RP. Uh, you know, it, it, that instance, for, for example, say that you have uh, two players that are, um, their character approaching the bridge, and you have a troll guarding it. You wouldn't start this off with, the troll walks up to you, and waves an arms around saying, you're not allowed to cross the bridge. Um, he would say, see the troll. The troll takes a step forward. Don't, don't, don't. You ain't crossing my bridge. Instances like that where it's that, that, that obvious barrier between the DM's narrative and the actual session itself and the in-game the in things that are happening. The obvious um break between the two concepts where it's like okay now we're in character yes and that and that helps character like when you use a voice and like mm -hmm. really get into it that helps them get into their character and i agree i agree it's hard to, it's hard to expect rp yeah. from a party when you're when you as a dm if you're not willing to like delve into the the zany parts of dming as well that doesn't mean to get crazy with the voices or anything like that it doesn't mean you have to do any of that. It just means like delving deep into the RP. Um, so you know, you I mean, have you to make sure that you're obeying these these kind of things that we're talking about too, where you don't 
break character and says the ogre walks over to you and says you know? right and you you can do this very simply and everybody can do this like i haven't met anybody that can can't do this you either you can make your voice softer and talk very subtle or if it's like a big bad evil guy and you can just really deepen down that voice and really date you know really dig deep right here and and uh <clears throat> and really just change your voice up uh it's not it you only have to use three tones if you want your normal voice a little bit softer higher voice and then a little bit deeper voice and j if that's all the three that you do and you just use facial expressions on top of that mm -hmm. it 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 sets the mood and that's what really yeah. matters setting the mood yeah. is everything yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. That, that that actual transition to set the mood and present the scene is a big key part of encouraging that role play. Um, so to kind of get into the questions that we've gotten uh, from our from our audience. Um, so from our, our first question from one of my players, uh, Drian, wants to know, how do you get your more reserved players into the RP? So like those kind of characters, the kind of players that are very hesitant about the the role playing sides of D and D. Like, uh, how do you kind of how do you kind of uh, foster that that connection with the role playing side? So uh, there's two ways of doing this, and uh, like the we can go back previously where you can besides the strongest char charisma actually charismatic character or person in real life, you know, being the one that talks all the time, you can specifically point those shy people out and like questions and stuff like that you can look at them directly and give like subtle hints to them that they should like that you want them to answer or you can politely ask your charismatic wonderful um, player to be like hey do you mind trying to encourage this player to role play by having them talk to him more in character and all that stuff and it really helps bring them out yeah one I think of the that, uh two best ways to be honest yeah. i remember one of the ways that i, I had a, I had a player who was uh very new to D D and was a very big time uh video gamer so like referred things in like senses of, like skyrim the witcher those kinds of things where it's like it's just like a video game but in your head instead right um <laughs> but uh kind of the thing that i used this particular instance that i used to encourage role play from them it worked wonders. Now, this might not work for everybody, but this particular example, I think, really helped a lot in this particular situation. I got to a point where um, the party at this point was uh, obviously protecting somebody from one of the lower tier villains who was trying to figure out the location where this villain was hiding. And I had the villain um, come in and defeat by knocking unconscious the rest of the party while they're in a tavern and corner the shy player and start questioning him from information thinking because you know the, sh the shy player is the one who was you know the, the, the least uh the least talkative so he felt like he could break him the easiest um so he went in there you know and started questioning him festering him and it was this one-on-one -on -one interaction with the rest of the party move, no one able to answer for him, where I was able to actually break through that barrier of comfortability with role-playing and present a situation where you're either role-playing or this guy's gonna start attacking you. And he's already taken out the rest of your party, so it would be a solo thing. Uh, and that, that might seem harsh, but this, this is meant to kind of put him in that element where he's like, okay, me as a role-player, like I understand that if I get into a initiative with this with this with this fighter, I'm not gonna win. So I need to find out the other means of methods. So I could either rely on my charisma, spell casting, what have you, to get me out of this, or I could literally just talk to him until the rest of my party is able to wake back up and, and save me. So he literally did this process of let's keep the bad guy talking while the rest of his party was able to get up. That's that's a really good way to really get him out where he's being a distraction. Did he open up after that too? Oh, he did. A after that, after that, he he did a lot more RPing. He became a lot more charismatic when it came to the role playing. As a matter of fact, um, in my current home home campaign, he plays a bard now. 
who is uh, is a uh, uh, College of Lore bard who literally he uh, he starts every episode with a recap of everything that's happened so far in character. So yeah, he's all about that RP now. So I have awesome. personal experience that that one, that that way works. Uh, that is amazing. Uh... <laughs> I'm gonna have to remember that. I'm gonna have to uh, uh, use that. <laughs> uh, so our next question: How about a player who has a reserved character? So the player is experienced with the RP, but the character themselves is a non-communicative or a like in the background kind of character. How do you how do you foster RP with those kinds of characters? I think. Um... I think those characters are fine. Um, they'll f naturally charismatic people will find a way to talk about talk within their character. I mean, it it is what it is. It's, that's how it is. I'm I'm the same way. I'm I'm charismatic, and I even if I play a reserved character, I probably will find a way to talk without breaking character. I don't know how to explain it, but um, but if they're like a reserved character, then give them something to talk about whether um it could be dreams that you give them for like uh foreshadowing of the uh campaign um you could uh, just like give them something to talk about to the group and if they absolutely just refuse to tell the group anything you're just like well uh you have all this important information that you probably should share but you're not so you might start a conflict eventually. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> either, either way, there's probably going to be RP. <laughs> um, that's one way of doing it. If you give give players important information like that that they need to share with the group or um, important NPCs to them, that would be what well, you would think that would be important to them uh, that yeah. they might enjoy like re um, returning to in the future, you know? You yeah. know, like like critical roles. Um, uh, what's the who Matt Soul in Critical Role Two? Uh, that's their you know shop guy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I forget his name in season one, but um, he's the, also the other shop guy. It's the shop. It's the shop guy in both of those seasons that they both enjoy coming back to. Gilmore. Mm -hmm. Gilmore. Gilmore. Yeah. Gilmore. Just to yep. give give those NPCs that are quiet uh, those or those players that that NPC that they would enjoy talking to yeah no I, I agree um one of the things that I've had to do recently um is instances where um sometimes I will have RP sessions where it's I'm RPing with the, with the quiet person giving exponential information or plot specific information that only their character has right and then once everyone else is back they have to provide this information for the rest of the party but they have to provide this information within character and I will not be doing any summarizing or correcting of their descriptions so based on their note taking and their role play describing it presents this in in interesting situation where it's like you either role play this thoroughly where it's you're providing information in, in in sync with what your character knows or you're kind of just bullshitting your way through it um, it's kind of a, a harsh thing but it provides this, this modicum of of necessity when it comes to roleplay and as, as a tabletop roleplaying game it is I always like to reference that it is a role R-O-L-E playing game not an R-O-L-L -L playing game <laughs> Uh, it's an it's a it's a it's an integral part of the actual tabletop role playing game. After all, you can't play Monopoly without money. You know, you can't play Stratego without the little cards. You can't play chess without the pawns. It's it's all a piece of it that's necessary for the actual game to take place. Um, so that kind of brings us to our next spot. Um, so we kind of answered this a little bit earlier with what's the best way to get someone to RP that's never RP'd or just started RP. But to kind of like put a t slight twist on this question, um, what is, in, 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 in your point of view, 
a way to get someone to like RP? How do you describe what RP is to someone that has never RP'd before? Like, how would you approach someone who's like, I am quasi interested in D and D because I heard about it from Stranger Things. Explain it to me. What is D and D? What is role playing? I would tell them, have you ever seen or have you ever heard of the books or read a book that's choose your own adventure? Mm-hmm. That's D and D. And then, um, if I would tell them, look at the look at the room around you. And I said, what do you see? And then they start explaining things. I was like, that's all you have to do with your imagination is explain what you see on the table in front of you in your head that your imagination is putting out there. And you might not see things at times, but you just sit there and be quiet. But the the more you imagine things and think about what you would want to say, that's when you'll start getting better. And uh, and like how to explain it to somebody is like, I can't. I think we had this question uh, over at our podcast where he was like, uh, Steve said very well that it's hard to explain to somebody when you have two failed death saving throws and two uh, passes and the last roll comes and you're like, like you can't explain that feeling, you know? And your whole party's about to get TPK'd or whatever and you got a, you got a mass, you got one hit, uh, spell slot left to do a healing healing word a mass healing word to get everybody up and to finish this fight or at least get yeah. out of the fight yeah or or that or that moment where it's like i can either heal one of my party members right now or i can take a shot at the big bad guy and i might have enough damage left to take him down yeah that's yeah that's so hard <laughs> it, it's so hard uh, to yeah. to like explain that to somebody it's like yeah. you'd have to you have to get put into those situations but I could how I said before it would be the easiest way to explain it to somebody that's never seen it I, uh, I, I, I used to choose your own adventure books as an example as well so <laughs> well I'm glad I'm thinking like a, a DM <laughs> that's been around for a while um so <clears throat> One of the uh, kind of one of the questions that I have uh, as well, <clears throat> when it comes time to like specifically the classic tavern setting where everyone's drinking, having fun, and laughing around, you are gonna have players as a DM. This is to all you DMs out there listening. You will have players as a DM who will take that as like, oh, we're stopping playing for a little bit. I'm gonna go and get snacks and a drink go use the bathroom and come back when, when the fighting starts. Um, <laughs> that is not a break in the game, guys. <laughs> it's an important, <laughs> integral moment. Uh, <laughs> one of the important things about those moments is that creates and fosters the connection between the characters. It, it creates the reasoning why you, as Talion Dolrug, the half work barbarian would care whether or not um, Fayeth uh, fucking <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> make a move names up on the fly. Uh, Fayeth Hollywood, the halfling uh, cleric, why you would be upset if she is unconscious and is bleeding out on the floor. Because if it's just dice rolls and determining who dies and who lives, you're not going to care. Because, oh yeah, they can make another character next session, it's all fine and good. No problem. Maybe they can make a character that'll serve us better. Get the weak ones out of here. Um, no, you want to foster those connections because it creates those moments where, you know, just the same as if you're reading a book. When you're reading a chapter where one of the characters that is really loved by you and has had those moments where are integral to the story and like these moments where are pure and role play centric, uh, where you can get these in exchanges and stuff that matter, that make sense, that make you understand the character on a deep level. Those take place in those tavern moments, in those those moments where there's nothing else going on besides the interactions behind, between characters and such. Those moments are key to making the, the story an actual story instead of just a bunch of dice rolls. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a good time to get snacks, but it's like, mm-hmm. um, 
As long as like you're not actively involved in an RP situation, if you hurry up and get a snack. But the a good way to do that is that you can make stuff happen at the tavern. It could be a tavern fight, a drinking contest, something like to get something that's role play heavy. Um, when I say tavern fight, I don't mean like roll initiative. I mean like role play the fight out, and you roll the hit, and that's it. And uh, and the damage on the table would probably... I, I would prefer just use unarmed strikes because uh, that way we're not killing people in a tavern. Yeah, and you got the monk over there just ripping people's bodies out of their souls. Or people's <laughs> yeah. souls out of their bodies. But, but but guess what? For that monk, that's like that's like one of his moments. He's like, yes, unarmed fighting. This is what I'm good at. So this is like mm -hmm. you're giving him something that he's good at. Mm -hmm. or, that's like giving the rogue to investigate and find traps and sneak around and stealthily scout ahead yeah uh, or uh, or you're barbarian in the middle of a fight to mm -hmm. successfully uh absorb all the damage and uh clerics doing a clutch healing spell you know like that mm -hmm. those are those are their moments and though like that's also part of um making it very important for your players like Make them their moments, like drinking contests. That's really good for anybody with a high con, which would be your barbarians, fighters, and uh, paladins, and so on. Um, that would really... I mean, you can make a drinking contest super fun. And maybe they drink too much. Maybe you make it a group drinking contest, and everybody drinks too much, and something happens at night, and maybe all their stuff's gone. Or... Um, maybe they wake up in a mysterious place and they don't know where they're at. Maybe they got their organs harvested. That'd be cool. Something weird like that. And they now they have a point of exhaustion from getting their organ, organs harvested until they're uh, properly healed or uh, by a proper healing spell. Yeah. Uh, and, and something cool like that, you know. Uh, yeah. That's... That's kind of things you can do in like those tavern moments, and um, maybe even like you don't even you don't even have to let your players start the fight. You as a DM could start the fight on a tavern. That that's fun, you know. Be like, yeah, <laughs> this guy just I, slaps the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah, I know you could pull the classic uh, Luke Skywalker says, "Hey, my friend here doesn't like you. I don't like you either." Exactly. <laughs> um. So, uh, our next question uh, from Lancelot. Have you ever reserved... Have you ever had reserved characters use body language or sign language as a method of communication? And how do you approach that? I've never personally seen that. And um, I think... I think it would be executed properly if worked correctly with the right DM. Um, but I... But if you're going to have issues... If you're you're gonna have issues with um, the other characters at the table, if you need to communicate with them, unless you have like some type of telepathy talk, where maybe or maybe somebody speaks for you and they understand your language too. So maybe work with another player and the DM, um, so you have at least a way to communicate through somebody um, with the lack of talking that's happening there. Uh, cause we had a, we had a warforged barbarian that only spoke dwarven and nobody else did. So, uh, that was a huge barrier, which was fun. It was absolutely hilarious because nobody understood what he was doing and he would just run towards anything that was happening. It was hilarious. But, uh, about, about 10, 15 sessions in, we finally got it worked out <laughs> and he started learning common. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think, like, so, like, me, like, with one of the, uh, the questions that one of the players that I had, um, with the, specifically the, the body and sign language side of things is I had one player, um, who played a, uh, a Kenku who, uh, only, only used Vine audios as their methods of communication. And that, this is again, my age here. Vine audios before TikTok or any of that other stuff. I, I was around for Vine. <laughs> uh, they only used Vine audios to communicate. So anything else that they try to communicate was done through that body language. 
Um, and in all honesty, I've had the players that, if, if they're choosing to embrace those kinds of characters, it's because they want the RP challenge, which means that there's someone that typically RPs heavy on the, on the normal, and now they want to put a little blockade, if you will, to try to overcome that with the challenge. If you've had a, if you have a instance where someone's, um, let's say, let's say you have a, a player who is hard of hearing or uh, mute or anything like that, um, then, then it comes time to like actually get down to the nitty gritty when it comes to things. Um, if you have a player who is, uh, who is, let's say, uh, mute, then I would recommend if you're an in-person game, then you actually can, you know have them keep a physical journal that they can pass around and write in in character or um, have them tr attempt to teach some of the characters um, certain like signs or stuff for things that are relevant to what the character would do you know the, the this, like for example if they're playing a ranger that is is mute maybe maybe for example they um, they uh, you should teach them the symbol for stop or look over there or, or anything like that where they can actually both impart some knowledge when it comes to sign language and it creates an RP centric moment where you can have a moment where they're sitting around a campfire um, on one after one long day of travel and you have the ranger at this instance trying to teach the uh, let's say a wizard um, different signs because it's going to be important for the actual adventure ahead. Hmm. That's uh, that's really good to like. It's like I understand. Like, I agree with you that the people that do those type of things are normally um, really good RPers, and they are looking to challenge self and really stretch on being creative. And uh, I see here that Lancelot was talking about how he had a deaf NPC and. One of my players do sign language. So I start with this uh, usual intro, but when my player spoke, I just, the shopkeep looks at you and begins doing gestures with his hand saying, I'm deaf. And the whole encounter was just me saying stuff. And that's, and that's really cool. I like that. Um, as a, I had it as a common is sign language. Yeah, that's like, that's a really cool way to do deaf. Um, or something like that. Just it's more of a flavor thing than a um, than like a handicap for in that instance, which is really. And I'm all about flavor. So, uh, so any player that comes to me with flavor, or I like to um, have a lot of flavor on my characters. So I try to bring that to the DM at the table so they always have something to work off of on my character i always have good backs back stories for the most part um i've had one that's that's a good backstory it's just it's just a a, uh, a younger i'm playing it for a bone that uh that just hadn't explored a lot um he just left home and this and this is how he started his adventuring so like give your give your dms ways of how to help you communicate and maybe you guys can really set up some great moments and uh and uh and really enjoy that kind of stuff at the table all you have to do is really work with your dm and all these things can uh work very well there will be some things that your dm won't be comfortable with but if your dm is not comfortable with it maybe you guys can hash it out and figure out something you guys can do yeah yeah i mean specifically just you know, speaking with your DM and making sure that you're actually, like, talking and, 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 like, communicating with your DM about what it is you're wanting to do, what it is you're not wanting to do, and stuff like that is the is the key to starting it off at all. Right. Um, so, our next question from Lancelot, have you ever had to cut a player who refused to RP or interrupted slash sidelined other players? Uh, I've never had to. Uh, I guess I haven't DM too much. Uh, but I would... Rob, like I would be very the ones that would be sidelining other players like being very intrusive or um, cause there's very uh, I just won't let other people I guess RP play their character 
I would probably have to have a conversation with them. And I probably would have more than one conversation to allow um to allow for some progression from that person to see if they would, you know, stop. But Yeah, that chance lack, for growth. Yeah, and lack of RP uh, I I love RP, but I don't think I'd ever kick somebody off the table for it because like maybe they just enjoy one of those people that enjoy just watching and just yeah. enjoy being quiet and soaking it all in. And I feel like as even the quiet ones stand around or, you know, sit around and listen, they'll eventually get to the point where they want to um, uh, want to RP and play with the uh, the rest of the group. Otherwise, they might feel, feel left out. And yeah, and and if and if you do have a character that is quiet, and make sure they don't feel left out. And maybe like, and if they do feel left out, bring it up to the other plays and maybe see if they'll uh, try to include them better. Because some people aren't just they don't dive in head first, so you have to ease them into it and make them feel welcomed. Um, because we're all nerds here, and I'm sure uh, one way or another, somebody has picked on you because of it. Yeah, I think that that, that it, it comes down to that that instance of, you know, the same as you. I I I've never I've never had to boot someone from my table for lack of role play. I will say that I've had to boot several people for combative role play. Those people who who will attack the other party members in the middle of a conversation because it's what their character would do, or those people who specifically make antagonistic characters. Um, when it comes time to that, or characters who were going to betray the party. Well, those can be interesting RP things to do for once in a while. There is there is a limit there where it's like it, doing anything overboard of that is it's counterproductive to the roleplay side because people get thrown off by the whole idea. Now, now I don't want to get invested in all these characters around me because this person over here and their character is taking away the, the, the fun from the table by making it all just a bullying type deal. Um, so I've had, I've had to boot people for that. And that's kind of pulls into that intrusive RPing where it's like, you know, for, for uh, give an example here. Um, let's say, let's say that um, a character, a character, a player who's playing a rogue has their character picking a lock and their lock picks break on a nat one trying to unlock the door and you have a dwarf walk up and strength check to kick in the door and look over and say I guess my foot's better than your lock pick that's fine that's an RP moment that is a that is a place where it is that antagonistic type vibe but it is not an instance where there is a modicum of combativeness between the players because the characters what i'm talking about is is where it's like um you know my 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 character is going to as soon as the uh as soon as the the the, the dragon's been defeated i'd like for my character to stab every everyone in the back and take the treasure and dip out those kind of players i do not allow at my table because it takes away from the role play I do not mind the antagonistic stuff when it's done like the first example where it's like that the you know, light teasing and that that uh, rivalry type thing. That's fine. But when it gets into the bullying side, it, it just doesn't become it, it loses the fun for the players. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like, um, I've heard of instances where people do stuff like that and if you're comfortable with your group and maybe like a group full of friends, you might be able to get away with something like that. And it might be funny like that, but that's kind of like, you have to know your crowd and who you're playing with. Um, so be cautious when you do things like that. Uh, and if you want to play that type of character, you should probably make sure it's okay with your DM for one. And for the rest of the group, uh, because some people don't want to tolerate that those type of characters. Uh, I have, 
I mean, I have I have evil characters in my that I've created that I really want to play, but all my evil characters have either an equal will either have an uh, uh, the same motive as the good people, or they will have a redemption arc in their backstory that I have built in for the DM to work around and um, give it a nice character story character arc. And, um, and maybe get the good players to learn and help with the redemption of the player besides doing it by, by themselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of brings us into our last question of, uh, with, uh, from Lancelot is how, how, how do you deal with, uh, quote, that's what my character would do end quote. So those kind of characters who, the Lan- example that Lancelot gives here is that, uh, a new player joins in, and for two sessions, one player keeps shutting that player out, even when others try to get that new player involved, because, quote, that's what my character would do, end quote. How do you, how do you deal with those kind of instances, and those kind of players who are interrupting RP-centric moments with instances like that? Um, those type of players would be talked to. That goes back to the... I talked to him a couple times, and then if, if it is... Um, if it's bad enough, I will ask. I would personally ask them to leave. It's, it's not acceptable to. Um, this is a, it's a team game, and you're supposed to work together. And if you're not being a team player, then get out. Like, like I just said earlier, I, I have evil characters built to be a team player, even with good characters. I was like, you can do those things, but the the excuse that's what my character would do. That's just unacceptable to be a bully or, a, you know, a total jackass. It's fun when you're doing, like, complete degenerate shit and you're like, that's what my character would do. And it's, it's a funny, it's a funny moment or you're, or you're trying to, um, or it's like one of those moments where something's being explained at the table, but your character's not there and you have no idea. You're like, I don't technically know that I'm there or what's happening so this is what my character would do so and and because I don't metagaming is not fun there there's a reason that it's the DM sets up these things and don't metagame and take that away from them and, yes uh, if he wants the party split or it just happens that way then you better learn and find out a way to get that player back to the group or you better run from that encounter or something to fix it. Um, it, Yeah. So it's part of the game. So don't do that. (laughs) Yeah. No, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, like, so to give you an example, like with, with, with mine, like, I think I have a a pretty good instance of explaining how I handled this the right way. Um, And now I hesitate to say the right way because there's a lot of different ways you can handle it, but, like, so many people handle it in a way that is very counterproductive to role-playing that it makes you want to say that this is the right way. So I'm going to just throw this out there as an example of a way that worked for me. Um, I had a player who, um, for the King's Call, who voiced that their character was starting to disconnect from the other characters and wanted to have that betrayal slash the betrayal moment right wanted to get that the whole stab the party members in the back kind of moment so i i communicated with the other players and said you know i was we're thinking about doing this we're thinking about going this route and i want to turn this into a narrative moment where it's going to be actually a, a key plot point and such that where things happen Um, so, what we did is, um, for the King's Call, we had the character Revoria, who, you know, being sort of power-hungry and disconnected from the party, grasped a magic item that was knowingly evil for power, and upon doing so, became possessed and fought the party, right? But we agreed upon this instance of that it was going to be this narrative type situation where she fought the party she ended up losing uh, but at the end of it as she is being banished from the realm that she was in um, she reached out to the party in her last modicum of being in control of herself and apologized for her actions and apologized for betraying the party 
and saying that she only wanted just to be stronger. That, that she never meant to hurt them. And it created this whole heavy-handed moment where where, you know, this this big roleplay-centric moment at the end of this betrayal turned the I stabbed the party members in the back into a this is an aspect of role playing now where it is embraced by the party where it becomes this pivotal moment in the story and now it all makes sense it's not just the player being a jerk it's not like anything like that it becomes a narrative part of the story yeah that's a really good way of doing it um and i think even like you would you took it a step further than i did where I probably wouldn't even have consulted with the players just because of the pure, pure um, dramatic effect of it, and I want I would want to see that on my players. But as long as you do it for narrative purposes, and not, and it fits the story really well, and it naturally happens, you shouldn't force it. It should naturally happen, and um, and it give your player multiple instances where they could turn evil. And you have that, and you're you're ready for those, you know, those where he picks the evil route. Maybe he doesn't take the first bait, not the second bait, not third. But you you're ready for it. You prep it, and if he doesn't take it, they, or they don't take it, they don't take it. But uh, if they don't take it, then you move on. Maybe a couple sessions later, it happens again. There's another way to the dark side of mm -hmm. betraying that and you're like okay maybe this is the one you prep for it all that okay they don't take it okay and then it just kind of happened naturally from their for their character i think is a better way to do it uh yeah and that way it's that way it's natural for them and natural for and you still get a surprise factor on that that party mm -hmm. and it's gonna be it's gonna be great yeah but uh but you i mean you you're still right for consulting your players but yeah I'm, i mean I'm, it, it's i mean it's, it's just reading the room like you know for, for this, that it, it, these players in this in this campaign this was a very long ongoing campaign that was very role play centric so i wanted to make sure that this this thing didn't just you know blindside the players into a state of non-role play where they're just kind of emotionally kept out uh kind of kind of give you an idea like the, the, the heaviness of the role the role play in this um literally uh one of the uh one of the actual characters within this uh, ended up getting the wedding vows between two of the characters between their character and the character that they married tattooed on them that's how heavy the role play was in this oh, no. um, <laughs> so i wanted to make sure that this didn't like send someone into a depression spiral you know um Holy so man. yeah <laughs> yeah um so to kind of give you that, that that's it's kind of like where that then ended up going um and it, it made it for this it was this huge moment like I, i'm talking like like i was act actively holding back tears <laughs> that's amazing like I think with that type of group, you could actually tell them ahead of time. But for characters or people that aren't roleplay heavy, um, you shouldn't tell them because their expression on their face will make you feel so good for that. You know what I'm saying? Because it might actually just that'd be another way to bring out RP in a in a in a player is giving them that wow factor. It would be. You know that that would be really good for a player that does RP very heavy. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, so to kind of wrap it up here at the end, um, what is one of your favorite role play moments that you've ever uh, either DM, GM'd, or been a part of? I can give you a combat scenario, which would be fairly short, and then I can give you a very recent um, scenario that happened where I'll do the combat one because it'll be very short well I'm playing Circle of the Moon Druid and uh, we were pl fighting a manticore at level 3 or 4 and um, the, man the manticore was doing its thing flying around and onto these ledges and it was really 
Nobody, I didn't have a ranged weapon at the time, and I was like almost fresh out of spell slots. And I had one wild shape change left, so uh, I was like, uh, I looked at my spells, I had I think one spell left, first level spell, and I was like, I have jump. I have jump, that's all I had that, I, that would be maybe useful. So I, I cast jump on myself and turned myself into a bear, which gave me a 30 foot jumping distance. <laughs> and I jumped onto a 30 foot ledge uh, it, it might, the numbers might be a little off but they uh, I c we did calculate I could make it with the jump spell and the bear strength and then I then the manticore flew to the other ledge and it was exactly 30 feet away from me and it was it was like, a, it was like an oh shit moment I have to make this and I made it and I killed the manticore by doing a DD uh, a, a suplex off the off the top rope onto the ground, thirty feet down. That uh, that honestly reminds me of, of my favorite one. It's kind of kind of funny how that works. Um, so this was way back when in the wilder years of me actually playing in games instead of just DMing them. <laughs> uh, I had a a character who was a um, was a wizard, um, and. He had this on and off relationship with the uh, with the female barbarian, um, and they were on one of those off moments, and they were fighting uh, this this uh, what was it? I think it was a fire elemental near the top of the a volcano, like we're near the caldera where it tumbles down into the lava, and the fire elemental upon dying created the explosion that it knocked them backwards uh so upon them killing it it knocked him backwards into the volcano and he used his his last remaining spell slot to true polymorph himself into a stone golem and hug her and lay his back into the lava when he crashed and then flay his arms out as he started melting so that way she could jump off of him onto the actual um, edge of the caldera and climb out as he kind of just sank into the lava. Oh, man. He, he, and he, he just had this moment where he was just like, I actually it was like actively like screaming out in like pain in this RP moment. And um, he he just chucked his, his bag up onto the edge to her when he sank fully into the lava. And after, after she got to a point where she was like actually like away from all the danger and everything had stopped, and she opened the bag and she found that he had had a uh, had a ring in there that he'd been holding on to for quite some time that he never got around to proposing to her with. It was just this huge moment, and like I remember it so vividly because it was just this huge moment of like he just grabbed her, hugged her, and, and like plummeted into the lava with the stone golem form uh, and as you know with the stone golem you aren't fire resistant but you're able to float for long enough that she was able to get off of him and there was no way that she was going to be able to fish him out of there that's awesome that is now, a great moment for those of you at, at the home like why not just why, why not just freaking polymorph into a flying creature well because I wanted it to be a sweet and tender moment okay that's a good character death like that's <laughs> Yeah, don't. Yeah, anybody that's listening, don't ruin that. That's a great character death. I would always want. I would always want that for any player. A great character death. In those quick fleeting moments like that, he, he in, in all honesty, he was thinking about keeping her safe. Was thinking about saving himself. That's that's that big thing. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that kind of that kind of capstones it on the encouraging role play sides of things. Uh, so, what is role playing degenerates getting up to over, over uh, on your guys' side of Discord? Um, there is a couple things. Uh, we are trying to set up a charity event, but we are having some issues. Um, I'm not going to give too many uh, details on it because I don't want to say anything till finalized. But we are working with uh, military and veteran game gamers um, to hopefully do an amazing charity event. Um, Veterans Day weekend in November. Uh, that's our big event. Um, 
our closest event is uh, we are going to Fan Expo in Chicago next week. Uh, we will be there Friday, Saturday, and possibly Sunday morning um, uh, and to hopefully meet a lot of, uh, I know I'm meeting, uh, if you guys know Mr. Dandy DM, I'm going to meet mm-hmm. the the lovely Mr. Dandy DM. He's actually mm-hmm. coming, he's actually coming to the ho- back to the hotel room to play a one shot with us. That's awesome. Uh, and I couldn't ask for anything greater because he's literally one of my uh, t- top three content creators. He's just an amazing person. Hey, and he's an amazing individual. And, so, uh, uh, what days will you be there? So, so I want to make sure that uh, for like date specific wise, that way if anyone anyone listening wants to see you there. July 8th, I think, which is Friday. We'll be there Friday morning uh, all day. Saturday all day at Fan Expo. Um, Sunday we'll be up in the air if we'll be in there in the morning. Uh, but uh, but definitely all day Friday and all day Saturday. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess I, like I agree. I love their stuff. Good stuff. I mean, up all, all, all up in D and D TikTok. So I I agree. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's amazing. Like uh, to like, I would never think I was. We've only been doing TikTok since January, early January. Maybe early January, late February, or early February, and we're already at to the point we are now, collabing with people that we didn't think we'd be collabing with because we thought they would outgrow us so quickly. And um, we're having amazing people on our podcast, and uh, it, it's it's just you know amazing stuff and uh, how quickly we're growing, and we're gonna be slinging out product here soon we're going to start um we're working on homebrewed races and subclasses and um we're fixing the artificer um if anybody is mad about the artificer as i am i feel like it was a little rushed and that they should have took more time on it. it's a little cluttered um i am i am personally fixing the artificer and hopefully veterans day weekend that you'll be able to see the first taste of it um of an amazing uh revamped artificer subclass um and and the first one i'm making will have no spells so uh i hope you guys are looking forward to that (laughs) i mean i i i i i I know i am i know i am i mean it's kind of it's kind of funny you mentioned uh um the uh january 1st 2023 uh vittore uh Flavored Enemy is releasing Welcome to Chrysanthia, which is the source book for everything that takes place within Tales of Vittore and Flavored Enemy Legacies. It includes all of the races, locations, and everything like that. It will be released for hardback edition covers and PDF downloads off of our, off of our merch site, which is so... We're going to be having that rolling out as well, as well as we also just released a bunch of new uh, uh, t-shirts and stickers and stuff like that. Uh, so I definitely feel you on the uh, on on the merch side of things. It's it's a good it's a good time to get into the uh, the D and D merch because like I got I got I was I was driving I was driving home from uh from my one of my friends' houses and I saw uh, one of the stickers for my podcast on a random vehicle randomly out in the wild just driving home saw my saw my own stickers on on the back of a vehicle I'm like I made it this this is the the pinnacle of success right. That's that's the pinnacle. You can't you can't go past that. Just randomly seeing my sticker out in the wild. Did you honk at him and like? Hey, oh, I did. That's I, me. I, I, I tried. I was sitting there trying to get a picture and everything, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was good. It's good. It's a good, good feeling. It's a good feeling. And I like. I can't wait to be to that point. I I, <laughs> I I will be there, and I will be doing D and D full time, and. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll always have side stuff, and but this is this is passion, and I want to be doing this stuff. Uh, and we're and we just hit 10k yesterday on TikTok. What a huge milestone uh, for us! Yeah. Like, I'm so excited for that because it opens up so much stuff when you hit 10k. I didn't realize it. Uh, our our uh, podcast has gone up 130 percent in in 30 days. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, I mean, 
we're definitely lagging behind you guys on the TikTok side. We're at like I think twenty five hundred on TikTok, uh, but our podcast is sitting really well. <laughs> we actually got a nice little accolade of being the number one podcast in the country of Azerbaijan for four weeks in a row now. Oh no, man, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. gonna have. To, uh, I'm. I haven't added you to my list of podcasts listening to yet. So this is <laughs> what's happening right now as we speak. I'm adding it, and I'm going to uh, send it to the Discord. It should right. just be. It's just flavored enemy. At flavored enemies, right? Yep, we have a uh, flavored enemy, the King's Call, which is our first season. Uh, it's a little bit rougher on the audio quality as we were trying to figure everything out. Um, and that's own encapsulated story. We have Flavored Enemy Tales of Vittore, which is the most recent one and is a lot better on the audio quality. And um, that is the current ongoing one. We have Flavored Enemy Legacies, which is our Patreon exclusive one shot. The first episode is available on Flavored Enemy Tales of Vittore. Um, podcast and they're also available to listen to live on our discord but to be able to, to be able to stream whenever you'd like you have to be a patreon patreon subscriber um and then our upcoming one which is july 13th is flavored enemy scourge of stars which is the star wars um alternate universe one so lots of different flavored enemy stuff coming up yeah i just followed all of them so i'll be i'll have a lot to do <laughs> uh <laughs> You know, for a a while. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and I get, I get, I get, I get. I'm looking forward to working more with uh, role playing degenerates too. Yeah, and uh, please, please come over, and we'll have to set you up a time to come on our podcast if you don't mind. Um, yeah. We can. Yeah. And maybe we can collab more about podcasts and stuff like that, so we can uh, yeah. help each other out and. Uh, we we also have that socials tab in our Discord. So mm-hmm. if you want help growing, uh, I know you got a good following here. If you want more people to see your stuff, man, just go ahead and just drop it there anytime. Yep, sounds good. And uh, thank you for coming on behind the screens. Hey, no problem. Thank you.